welcome everyone. Can you hear me all right? Put it yeah. Up. yeah. Okay, that's good. Uh, I'm Patrice, Patrice Kelch, and I am um, substituting for Shelly tonight. So I'm really happy to see people logging in. It's really wonderful to be here to practice together tonight. So the format for tonight is um, that we'll have a gently guided meditation for about 25, 30 minutes. And then um, I will um, talk with you about, uh, we've been, Shelly's been following this really great book called Listening to the Heart. And we're on the chapter in here on Nibbana. And I'm going to talk about something that Kitasaro, the author, just very briefly touches on the story of the heavenly messengers. So that's what I'll be talking about when uh, we're done. But make sure that you're uh, in a position that allows you to be comfortable and just really feel like you're arriving here. Okay. And if you would prefer to have your um, video off, if that makes it more comfortable for you to meditate, that's completely fine. So it's ever really most supportive for you. So as we begin this meditation period, just really allow yourself to be in the space that you are. Allow yourself to be in your body, however that is. And that's not always easy for everyone. So as best you can, be here, be embodied. And just see if it's possible to rest in awareness. In awareness of the present moment's experience. So often when we meditate, we take it on like another task, something we have to get right. And see if instead of doing a meditation, you can just be the meditation. Just letting the mind rest in the natural awareness of embodiment. And you may like to use the breath as a support and that's fine, but you don't have to put the attention with the breath. You can just be open to how it is. And see if you can rest in that awareness. Just being really with the present moment's embodied experience.
And if the mind is really racing or there's lots of planning going on, that's completely, <coughs> that's completely okay. That is the present moment's experience. And you can just give it a lot of space. As if those thoughts were just clouds in the sky. And you put a lot of space around them. And just let them move off of their own accord. And the body very naturally accepts on the in-breath and lets go on the out-breath. Just this very natural rhythm of accepting and letting go on a physiological level. And we can just rest in that.
And for the last few minutes of this meditation, see if you can bring about a felt sense of gratitude. And it could be something as simple as just a real appreciation for your coming through with your intention to be here tonight, with that intention to show up and to practice and just really appreciating that so often life gets in the way of our good intentions. And tonight you were able to follow through. So that might be something for which you can just bring your awareness to that sense of gratitude, that felt sense of gratitude. Gratitude is sometimes said to be the single most effective intervention for a sense of well being. So thank you for being here to practice tonight. Um, and do what you need to do to make yourself comfortable. You need to stand up and stretch a little bit or get something to drink. And I'm looking to see if we have any animals in the gallery because it's sort of not an official zoom unless someone's cat or dog makes an appearance and uh my dog is extremely shy and uh is hiding out so so uh as i mentioned earlier and um that shelly has been working with this beautiful book by Hitasaro and Tanisara, Listening to the Heart, uh, A Contemplative Journey to Engage Buddhism. And the chapter that um, we're on right now is chapter nine, which is about Nibbana. And Kitasaro is the uh, author of, of that. And uh, he mentions in the beginning of this, the story of the the Buddha and his encounter with the heavenly messengers. And, you know, the, the sort of archetypal mythic story about the Buddha um, is that the Buddha was uh, a prince and actually the Buddha's father was a, a chieftain. He was a, a sort of a feudal state of Sakya and his father was the the head person there. And the Buddha grew up 
in um, what was considered luxury for for that time. And the story is that when the Buddha was an infant, um, that um, um, an astrologer said he would either be um, a wheel turning monarch or a very uh, prominent sage. <clears throat> And the Buddha's father was primarily interested in him becoming um, a ruling monarch. And so the story goes that he really protected the Buddha from any unpleasant experiences, that uh, the Buddha had a life that was very much devoted to, um, to the sort of, of pleasures, um, athletic events, um, that he had a, a very sheltered life, was kept away from the very harsh realities of, of life. And as the story goes, the Buddha um, asked his attendant uh, to take him out. And uh, he goes out and he sees a really decrepit, um, bent over, uh, very twisted elderly person. And he asks his attendant, you know, what is, um, what is the matter with him? And uh, the attendant says, well, he's just very, very old. And, um, you know, the Buddha says, why is he like that? And the attendant says, well, this is, you know, sort of what happens to people. And then they, the story is either told that they go out on a series of nights or it's a long night, you know, it's sort of like um, uh, Charles Dickens and, and a Christmas carol. Uh, these different sorts of, of apparitions. But the second um, encounter is with someone who is extremely sick and, and suffering. And again, um, the Buddha to be uh, Siddhartha Gautama had never encountered uh, anyone in that kind of, of suffering, uh, being that sick. And he again, asks his attendant and the attendant said, you know, this is what happens to people. People get really, really sick. And finally he comes across, uh, they come to uh, a corpse that's being prepared to be burned on a pyre. And um, he is distraught with the, the notion, this is a person who has died and this is the end that we all come to. Now, it, you know, it may seem very, very fanciful that how could, an adult young man never learn of this. But, you know, this is a sort of um, mythic fable and, uh, and it really um, challenges the sort of assumptions about the life that um, the Buddha to be was leading. And after seeing these three, the the very um, decrepit elderly person, the suffering of the sick person, and just the uh, the sort of inertness and the um, you know the the body of the the dead person and the the family weeping, um, the Buddha is is quite distressed um, by this, and then he sees the fourth of the messengers is. Um, he sees a, a renunciate and, um, or a seeker. And this person looks um, calm and, and composed and um, untroubled. And so that is the sort of spur for the Buddha to leave the household, leave his wife, leave his infant son, and uh, go on this sort of spiritual quest um, because he is so distressed by the, uh, by the suffering that he saw in this elderly person and this um, very sick person and, uh, and the corpse. And actually in the, the suttas, the, the Buddha says, um, the vanity of youth, health and life left when I realized that I too am subject to aging, sickness, and death. 
And in some of the other expressions of this, the Buddha's response to seeing this is, um, is to feel humiliated by it, to feel disgusted by it. I mean, it's, it's a, an extremely visceral response. And whether the Buddha actually went out and saw these people or whether, as some have suggested, it was just this sort of a reflection, this very existential reflection on life. It was this that caused the Buddha this um, revulsion actually about the human experience and the sort of suffering that he encountered that um, caused the Buddha to uh, the Buddha to be to uh, take off. And um, it's also, I think it's just worth knowing that 2,600 years ago when the, the Buddha to be Siddhartha Gautama was alive, um, it was a time of just tremendous cultural and political ferment in the Gangetic Plain. And it was a time when all these sort of small feudal states were being um, absorbed into much more uh, to larger states and um, the society was changing from a much more feudal rural society to something that was kind of more city-based with much stronger rulers, much stronger authority. And it was also a time when the religious norms of the day were being challenged. The authority of the Brahmin priests was being challenged all over. So it's the time when the Jain religion was established and um, there were numerous sorts of uh, people exploring spiritual life. And there was also um, a university um, that um, was about 600 miles from where the Buddha grew, grew up to that many people entered. There was this huge center of, of learning. So it's um, the Buddha to be was in some sense, very much a, a representative of his of his time in, in feeling this kind of spiritual churning. And of course, as you know, as the story goes on, he goes off and he studies with some people who were considered great masters um, of concentration practices, of yogic practices, of um, sort of um, mental disciplines. And he is offered positions in those communities and he turns it down and he decides, well, that's not, you know, this sort of extreme mental effort is not getting me where um, I need to go. And so he becomes an extreme ascetic. So from his luxurious life uh, as, as he was growing up to uh, this um, experience of horror, ex the existential kind of, of um, dread that he felt, to studying with people who were, were very, very adept at uh, developing the mind and having really exquisite concentration practices. But once you came out of it, it was gone. So that didn't really solve the problem. So the Buddha's next attempt was to really just engage in these extreme ascetic practices. And he did it with a, a group of, of other people who are also interested. And at one point he said, you know, when he touched his navel, he could feel his spine, that he just was so, um, he thought maybe the mortification of the body was the way to, uh, to deal with this. And on uh, the brink of death from this, he, uh, he remembers an experience that he had as a child. And it was an experience while his father was engaged in, um, a uh, spring ritual uh, about plowing the fields. And he remembers being a small boy sitting under a rose apple tree and just having this feeling of contentment and ease and sort of uh, oneness with the way things are. That he remembers as a child having this extraordinary experience of a real contentment and settledness and, and awareness. And at that point, when he is sort of at the brink of death from starving, he thinks maybe there is a kind of middle way of not just, um, you know, sort of having luxury or asceticism or, you know, really, really straining the mind, 
but there might be something that is um, a path that's not a path of extremes in which this sort of uh, contentedness, this sense of freedom, this sense of um, contentment in a way is possible. And as the story goes, um, a woman named Sujata uh, finds him and offers him nourishment. And then he goes and he just sits under the Bodhi tree until he comes to um, an understanding of suffering and the way to, um, to, um, to work with suffering. And that's by you know, the Eightfold, the Noble Eightfold Path. But what I want to focus on um, tonight in our uh, discussion is really this idea about the, the heavenly messengers and how we encounter them in our own lives, how we work with aging, sickness, and, um, and death. And um, I was listening to uh, a meditation this morning, um, an insight timer, a, a wonderful teacher named Zohar Lavi, who sometimes teaches at Gaia House in England, although I think she's based in Israel. And it was on aging, sickness, and death. And she kept saying, my brothers and sisters in aging, sickness, and death. And it was just such a beautiful um, meditation that this is something that we are all brothers and sisters in aging, illness, and death. And you know, there's the, um, the chant that we do at Common Ground very often, the, the daily reflections. I am of the nature to age. I have not gone beyond aging. I am of the nature to sicken. I have not gone beyond sickness. So I'm going to read the sutta that that comes from. So bear with me. It's a little, a little long, but I think it's, it is very, very interesting. So it's called the Upa Jatana Sutta, the subjects for contemplation. And this is the Buddha speaking. There are five facts that one should reflect on often, whether one is a woman or a man, lay or ordained. Which five? I am subject to aging, have not gone beyond aging. This is the first fact that one should reflect on often, whether one is a woman or a man, lay or ordained. I am subject to illness have not gone beyond illness. I am subject to death, have not gone beyond death. I will grow different, separated from all that is dear and appealing to me. That's the fourth one. And the fifth is, I am the owner of my actions, heir to my actions, born of my actions, related through my actions and have my actions as my arbitrator. Whatever I do for good or for ill, that, uh, to that I will fall heir. These are the five facts that one should reflect on often, whether one is a woman or a man, lay or ordained. Now, based on what line of reasoning should one often reflect? that I am subject to aging, have not gone beyond aging. There are beings who are intoxicated with a typical youth, intoxication with youth. Because of that intoxication with youth, they conduct themselves in a bad way, in body, in speech, and in mind. But when they often reflect on that fact, that youth's intoxication with youth will be either abandoned or grow weaker. Now, based on what line of reasoning should one often reflect that I am subject to illness, have not gone beyond Ill illness? There are beings who are intoxicated with a typical healthy person's intoxication with health. Because of that intoxication with health, they conduct themselves in a bad way, in body, in speech, and in mind. But when they often reflect on that fact, 
that healthy person's intoxication with health will either be entirely abandoned or grow weaker. And it goes on, you know, on what line of reasoning should one often reflect that I am subject to death, have not gone beyond death. And the Buddha again says, you know, that there are beings who are intoxicated with, um, with health. And so the Buddha says, no, if we reflect on these heavenly messengers and we reflect on the fact that we'll be separated from uh, what is dear to us and that all we have that's really ours is our own intentional action, that that's what we are responsible for, that that will enable us to uh, let go of this, uh, this intoxication with, um, with these, uh, with youth and with health and with life. Um, and he said, um, now based on what line of reasoning, I'm sorry, a disciple of the noble ones considers this. I am not the only one subject to aging who has not gone beyond aging. To the extent that there are beings past and future passing away and re-arising. All beings are subject to aging, have not gone beyond aging. When he or she reflects on this, the factors of the path take birth. He sticks with that path, develops it, cultivates it. As he and she sticks with that path, develops it and cultivates it, the fetters are abandoned, the obsessions destroyed. Further, a disciple of the noble ones considers this. I am not the only one subject to illness who has not gone beyond illness. I'm not the only one subject to death who has not gone beyond death. I am not the only one who will grow different separate from all that is appealing to me. A disciple of the no noble ones considers this. I'm not the only one who is subject of my actions, heir to my actions, etc. When he or she often reflects on this, the factors of the path take birth. He sticks with that path, develops it, cultivates it. And the fetters are abandoned, the obsessions destroyed. So I have really found this sutta so interesting, this whole idea of being sort of intoxicated um, with youth and this, this sort of intoxication with youth and youthfulness leads to all sorts of um, unskillful speech acts and um, thoughts and ideas. And when we reflect on the impermanence of, of youth, health and life and the inevitability and the universality of aging, illness and death, um, it inclines us to be careful in our speech, in our action and in our mind. So I'd like to look a little bit and a little more personally at each one of the three initial messengers. And then finally, the, the fourth. Um, see if you can remember as a little thought experiment, when you first became aware of aging, perhaps you had an elderly person in your life and you noticed how different that person was from you, maybe wrinkled face, spotted hands, constriction of movement. Can you remember what you thought? Can you bring back any of those childhood attitudes? Were you curious about it? Were you repulsed? Were you fascinated? And what kind of attitudes did you have about aging as you were growing up? You know, we ask children all the time how old they are, but it's considered really rude to ask an adult how old they are. We don't, we don't prize age, we often disguise it 
in our our culture and we praise people for their their youthful looks just think about your own experience with aging and the sort of attitudes that and i think this idea about being sort of intoxicated with youth i think in a culture that is so um, youth oriented as our culture is. And there are other cultures, you know, where persons who are elders are tremendously uh, respected. There are, are other cultures in which um, age is revered and elders are revered and ancestors are revered, but that's not um, what we generally see, at least in the popular culture in the United States. Your own experience may be different, but really think about how, um, you know, it sounds so awful when we say that the Buddha said he was humiliated and sort of disgusted by seeing this, but you know, our, our response to aging often is to regard aging as uh, something that is humiliating. So we can explore how we feel about our own aging um, right now. You know, if you're young, are you dreading aging? If you are older, do you see it as an accumulation of losses? Or do you see becoming older as, um, you know, becoming less valuable, less visible? Or is it becoming wiser, more tolerant, less judgmental, more loving, kinder? It's interesting that some of the data around aging is if you are healthy, and that's a big if, if you are healthy and you are not um, living in dire circumstances, poverty, that a person's 60s, 70s, and 80s can be among the happiest times in their lives. Very interesting data. Now, if, if you are sort of physically and materially fortunate, um, your, your older years may be among, uh, among the happiest. Um, so it's something just to, to consider how we, um, whether we've been intoxicated with youth and right now, um, how it is that we, we understand uh, aging and can we understand it in this, in this way of growing wiser, growing more tolerant, more loving, less judgmental. With ill health, um, when I do the, the five daily reflections, the way I phrase it um, for myself is, you know, I am of the nature to age, I'm growing old. And the second one I always phrase as, um, I am of the nature to sicken, illness and infirmity await me. So right now I am happily a healthy person, but I really try to remember daily that illness and infirmity um, await me. And in this time of COVID, I think all of us have been um, really aware of the possibility of serious and incapacitating illness. Um, and we may have already experienced it. And um, I know for some of our community members, um, they've lost family members um, to COVID. So I know that this is something that has been really um, getting very, very close to people um, right now. Um, so we have this, 
uh, often this dread of illness, this dread of incapacity. Um, you know, uh, if you remember, for those of you who've been here for a while, in the earlier sections of this book, Kitasaro talked about his time as a monk when he was really ill and how ashamed he was of that how he felt he was useless, he was a drain on the community, that he'd been very, very healthy as a, a young man. And um, you know, he had a very terrible reaction to a, a centipede bite in Thailand. And then I think he had typhoid fever for um, many years, but he was really sick for many years. And he just writes about how, uh, how kind of ashamed he was that he was, uh, he was a sick person. And so I think um, when we are healthy, you know, it is a sort of intoxicating feeling that this is the way it is and this is the way it should be. And I often think of the comments that you know, people from the disability community sometimes refer to um, non-disabled people as tabs temporarily able-bodied. And I think that's a um, something really that is um, worth considering. We are temporarily able-bodied. For most of us, um, illness and infirmity is inevitable. Although you know, some people die very suddenly, very violently, can die young. So being old, old enough to be sick is actually um, the good fortune of living, living a long life. But most of us can anticipate, you know, illness and infirmity um, await me. And with COVID, it seems very, um, it may be very close. And I think that's something that we're all really aware of. But what can illness, ours or others, teach us? Um, what can it engender in us? I think about um, compassion, um, patience, gratitude, love. You know, we can be grateful when we are being taken care of. We can have patience. Um, and we can really uh, develop, uh, if we are preparing, we can the, develop the capacity to be gracious. Um, many years ago in the late 90s, uh, I was a, did hands-on care for people with HIV AIDS. And um, I was always so grateful as a caregiver when people actually let me help them and they didn't insist on doing something really hard and painful themselves. And they'd always say, I don't wanna put you out. You know, I don't, you know, uh, they'd be so um, embarrassed that I would have to change a diaper or um, take care. And, and I was so grateful to do it. And one time when a client said to me, he said, don't you ever get tired of changing my poopy diapers? And I said, you know, when I'm, uh, when I'm in your position, when I'm old and someone is changing my poopy diapers, I want that person to be just like me. And, and I really meant it because I just loved I love the people I took care of. And I mean, it was such a, a, a remarkable experience. And I think it really you know, developed those capacities. And I could see for some of the people I took care of, it brought out absolutely the best in, in them. And for other people, it was much harder. Uh, it was much harder to let go of being independent, of being healthy. And I just would like to mention for those of you who are interested in this, there's a wonderful um, Buddhist practitioner named Tony Bernard, Tony with an I, B-E-R-N-H-E-R-D, who has been 
uh, chronically ill for the past 15 years and has written a great book on how to be sick. So it's, and it's, it's a book for practitioners. And she talks about being a, a practitioner um, who is, has a, a chronic um, illness, a post-viral syndrome. So that would be, if you're ever interested in reading more about that, and it also has a lot of information in that for caregivers. So death, I am of the nature, what I say every day is I am of the nature to die. My death approaches daily. I think every day, that is one less day that I will be, be living. And you know, that may sound grim, but it is, um, it's really an invitation to live really fully in those, um, in this day. And when I was taking care of people with um, HIV AIDS, uh, now I was with a number of people who, who died. And most of the people were in their early middle age, although I took care of um, a grandmother in her 60s. And I was with uh, numerous residents during their dying process and with more than a handful when they actually died. And while it was always the end of a person's suffering, at least the suffering of the person who died, it was always sad, but it wasn't unnatural and it wasn't frightening. You know, sometimes it just seemed like blowing a candle out. Um, but it did really um, make me realize how hard it is for loved ones and, uh, and caregivers. And um, especially when a person did not have the death that they wanted. And some people had some pretty elaborate ideas about how they wanted to die, what kind of music, who they wanted in the room, what they wanted. And um, sometimes despite everyone's best efforts and best intentions, it didn't happen. And I don't think it mattered all that much to the person who was actually dying. But everybody felt really bad afterwards who couldn't accommodate that. And I think that's a lot of the, the sort of sorrow that people are having right now with COVID when people can't be with their loved ones as their loved ones are dying. And um, it's, That's just really, um, really sad. And uh, I, I think it is helpful for us as we think of our own death and the deaths of others to really um, let go as much as we can of our um, visions of how it should be or we want it to be that it's really this bringing that, that sort of responsiveness to what is in the present moment that is, um, is really helpful. Having a tremendous, tremendous amount of flexibility around that and uh, a lot of compassion. Again, I think that what um, death really invites in us is again this just tremendous development of compassion and humility we're all going to die and we are all sisters and brothers in um in aging illness and death and um and realize that it's just it is a, a letting go it is a letting go and when we are intoxicated with uh, living and hanging on, it is really a natural um, letting go. The other thing that I, I learned uh, while I was at the um, this uh, residence taking care of people with HIV, there was a woman uh, in her 60s and she was dying. And um, every time when I would leave, she was not conscious, not eating, 
not drinking. And I would hold her hand and I would sort of wish her well. And I worked part time, so I wasn't there every day. And I would leave and I was sure that she would be dead when I came back. And this is someone who just hung on for a very long time. She had been a really hard worker all her life. And she just was kind of like the energizer bunny. Like she just kept on ticking away. And at this time, I'd always leave being sure that I knew that this person was going to die um, before I had my next shift. And one night when I was thinking that my husband, who is a racquetball player, playing racquetball with someone um, was a good player, um, early 50s, and um, they had a match. And my husband surprisingly won the match because this guy's a really good player. And he said, this, this person said to him, he said, you know, I don't know what's wrong with my game. You, you won the match, but let's do a, a third game and let me see if I can get my serve back. And on the second serve, this person dropped dead on the court. And, um, you know, it just, it was such a juxtaposition for me that here I was sure that this dying woman was going to die. And she kept on living for, um, it was at least a week. And here was this, this really healthy man who had, or he wasn't really healthy, but he didn't know that he was going to have a heart attack on the, on the racquetball court. And he did not know that he had had a heart attack before. And that was discovered later that he'd have one, but he didn't know it. But you know, that this sort of, of the, uh, the juxtaposition has just made it so clear to me that we never know when it is that we're going to die. And it's really important for us not to have unfinished business, that it's, you know, this has just made it really clear to me about, you know, never leave the house having said something really pissy um, because, um, you know, it just, it will be an, an ongoing regret. And I think this is something for all of us just to, to really, because as Buddhists, you know, we think about impermanence all the time. Impermanence is the great teaching in our uh, tradition. It's the great teaching. That that's what's, um, and it's the resistance to impermanence that made the, the Buddha to be so horrified by, um, you know, aging, illness, and death, because wanted the permanence of um, youth and good health and uh, vitality. Um, but death is the great, the great equalizer. And I do have actually another book recommendation for folks who are interested in sort of exploring more about death in a very practical way. And it's a book by a Zen practitioner who has also been a palliative care nurse. And it's got this great title, Advice for Future Corpses like a very Buddhist title, Advice for Future Corpses and Those Who Love Them. And it's a practical perspective on death and dying. And the author is Sally, S-A-L-L-I-E, Tisdale. And she's um, a palliative care nurse in Portland and a, a writer. And um, it's a, a great um, resource. So we come to the the fourth of the heavenly messengers, which is the renunciate or the seeker, which is, you know, us, right? Um, and uh, this is the person who's not intoxicated with youth or with health or with vitality. This is the person who is not bound by fear, who doesn't respond with disgust and humiliation to aging illness and death. This is someone who really understands the conditioned nature of all of our experience. You know, what, whatever arises passes away. This is someone who has made their peace with impermanence, with how things are. And they're willing to see that clearly. And in seeing that clearly, seeing clearly the consequences of actions, this person finds a kind of, of freedom. And isn't that what we all really want for ourselves? 
that's certainly what the Buddha wanted. Wanted this sort of, of freedom from living this, this life of um, intoxication, this life of fear, this life where we're always running from suffering and not able to, uh, to understand it, to appreciate it. Um, and I would just ask you to think, what would this freedom look like for you? I'm gonna end with a, a poem from another book I love called The First Free Women, if you could see it. They're the poems of the early Buddhist nuns, the first free women. And um, this is a, so this is by Wisaka. These are, are the poems from the, the order of nuns at the time of the Buddha. You say you're too busy, that there's never enough time. Take care of whatever you have to take care of. Then sit. Be honest. Do you really think you're going to live forever? So we've got some uh, time left if people have um, comments or questions or um, would love to hear you, uh, your responses. So just um, unmute yourself and jump in. I, I think sometimes when we're, when we're sick enough, not deathly sick, but you know, when we are sick or incapacitated in a way, I mean, it really is a, an incredible opportunity to watch the mind, um, often to watch a lot of self-judgment um, that, that people can uh, really get down on themselves for, um, for being sick. Um, I mean, and, and you can, as you said, you, you um, the sort of socialization comes up, you know, that you can remember, uh, you know, it, it's such an invitation to, um, to really bring some, some mindfulness and some, some inquiry to really understand ourselves better and to see where we've been hooked and, and attached if we're at that place that we're not so sick that we can't um, that we can't really have some sort of, of wise um, reflection, and um, so it sounds like you've been using your time your time well in uh, really coming to some sort of understanding and uh, appreciation. So thank you for sharing, Kyle. Now, I, I think the, the part about uh, the shame we feel about being uh, being sick and and how there is given our culture's kind of um, intoxication with health, uh, how easy it is to uh, blame people for like the way that you know their their lifestyle or uh, the, the choices they they made, and it's as if um, you know, there, there's uh, a tremendous amount of control over um, what happens to us. And often um, people are ill because of the zip code they live in. That's, that's, you know, the, that's the, the biggest predictor of a person's lifespan and a person's health is the zip code in which they live. And um, people are often blamed for um, not living a healthy life when they live in circumstances that make it almost impossible to be um, to be healthy. But uh, in our very judgmental and blaming culture, um, deviations from that ideal are um, are often castigated. So it's it's you know something for which we can all really develop better antennae and really uh, increase our capacity for compassion.
I mean, you know, as, as Zohar Lavi said, you know, brothers and sisters in aging, ill health and dying, you know, we are all together in this. Um, no one is exempt. So it's, it's a really powerful um, reflection. And as the Buddha said in that sutta, it really inclines us to good and beneficial acts. When we really take this seriously, we are inclined to be um, more compassionate, um, more giving, more loving. So that's my wish for all of us. And it's almost nine, so um, I will uh, offer the uh, sharing the merit, which is um, a Buddhist ritual that is an act of imaginative generosity. So if there's any merit to our efforts this evening, any blessing, any goodness that would come to us we would happily, gladly, joyfully share it with others. In fact, we would give it all away. We'd give it to our parents, our teachers, our friends, family, our community, the people we love. We give it to people we don't know, here and everywhere. We would give it to the two-leggeds, the four-leggeds, the wigan, the scaly, the slithering, all the creatures, all the beings. And in your own heart, you might want to bring to mind some group that you would especially like to remember tonight. And I think about all the people suffering with and from COVID and all of the amazing medical staff who support them, who have helped them. We would offer our, all of our blessings to them. May all beings find ease in their lives. May all beings find a path to peace. So good night, everyone. Thank you for, um, for being here. So take care. And Shelly will be back next week.